This is a sketch of uh, St. Vincent providing bread to the poor. If you remember your world history about uh, 17th century France, there were two classes of people. There was a small class of the aristocrats and a large class of everybody else, and the job of the everybody else was to take care of the aristocrats. Uh, into that context came a, name, a guy by the name of Vincent de Paul. Vincent really didn't have a great calling from God to be a priest, but he saw that as a vehicle through which he could get an education. And he's stationed after his ordination uh, at uh, one of the estates of these aristocratic families. Uh, his job is to teach the children of the aristocrats, but also to care for the spiritual needs of the peasants uh, who work the estate. And as he did that, he became acutely aware of the suffering uh, of those who were poor and the peasants, uh, and began to get this great commitment to be able to serve them and alleviate some of their suffering. And so what he began to do is to bring around himself uh, aristocratic women who, number one, had the money, uh, and number two, uh, the ability to bring some organization to his works of charity. And paramount among them was a woman by the name of Louise de Merillac. Uh, this is a mosaic of St. Louise and showing uh, some of the various works of the Doors of Charity. She had an incredible knack for organization uh, and so uh, she joined with Vincent in his passion for caring for the poor and together they founded the Doors of Charity in 1633. So this is a sketch of St. Louise giving instructions uh, to some of the Daughters of Charity. And that kind of drive that the daughters had, uh, they devoted their lives to caring for the poor and, and those who were sitting at the edges of our society. That's the same kind of drive that we want to make sure to cultivate and continue in, in our work today. Uh, it, it is at the core of who we are and the core of, of our identity and, um, uh, and our mission. I went to the doctor, I found out I was pregnant, and my doctor immediately freaked out because he could see the heartbeat, but he couldn't pick it up, and he kept saying, something else is in there, something is going on. And I'm like, okay, I was excited, now I'm scared. What else is going on? And he said, I don't know, I think there's another one in there. So I get upstairs, and they assure me they're not conjoined, but they're definitely two, um, and that they were in the same sack with no membrane. So. They were what we call mono mono twins. Too nervous to call my husband and tell him, so I took the ultrasound pictures home, and he said, "Okay, well, let me make my plate. I can I can take anything while I'm eating." <laughs> and he got the ultrasound and he dropped his plate and he was like, "Are there two? This says baby A and baby B. What? Are we having twins? Oh my God, is this serious?" <laughs> became very worrisome for me because you th the biggest complication is watching their cords. And I think I was just in a big bout of depression because I'm like, if I get super excited and I lose them, what am I gonna do? I'll probably never be the same. So if I keep my happiness down, <laughs> maybe I can keep my anxiety under wraps because my mindset was I will not glorify the problem. I will glorify my God. God can do anything. And it's something about the slogan here. With God, nothing shall be impossible. And I'm like, I gotta get to St. Thomas. I have to get there, I have to get there. Because that continued even to encourage me and inspire me. Immediately, I started crying because that's all I waited for. And that's all I prayed for. And it's like, okay, they're here. I don't have to worry about this anymore. Let me just take care of them. I was so excited. My husband started crying. He said, I tell you that. But he did. He lost it. <laughs> it's all for you. Thank you.
Each moment of life is sacred, um, and the, the time of birth is a particularly important and celebratory moment. Um, to be able to be present at the time of birth, uh, the miracle of birth, to be able to uh, assist families uh, to understand and appreciate the, the great dynamic of that moment is a, a great privilege for us to be able to do. Most gracious God, we come to you this day offering our whole selves to you. Offering our words, our actions, our dreams, our fears. Trusting in you. We come to you praying that in our thinking we would think your thoughts. That in our speaking we would speak your word of healing. That in our hearing we would hear your truth. And we pray that we would make your will our own. So that in all we do today we would walk in your love and in your peace. Be with all those who come and go from this place. As we lift to you those who are sick, those who visit, and those who serve. For you know the needs of every heart, and we offer them to you now. In your name and in your love we pray. Amen. I can remember back when I was about eight months old, I was standing up in the crib. What happened yesterday and today, I'm like, forget because I had two strokes in the last four years. That lot up I got. But back then when I was growing up, no. Those are her memories that suck. Stuck in my mind. Uh, my man here goes hard for a year. Um, strokes, the doctors have tried, I've had 18 heart attacks, and they tried everything they could, and they're tr still trying everything they can. They haven't gave up, no, I've, I haven't gave up, you know, I'm not going to give up, because till the God the time, time God calls me, I'll be here. <laughs> in our perspective, we understand that death is uh, just a moment in a much larger journey. Um, and uh, for those who have cultivated and developed a, a deep spirituality rooted in hopefulness, then death is not seen as a catastrophic end. Uh, and, and so uh, all of us uh, need to be reassured at the time of impending death um, that, that death is not the end of everything, uh, that there is life on the other side of death, uh, it, it, maybe in ways that we cannot even conceive. My mom will tell you a whole lot of prayer when it's to these kids, you know, but it, it helped to calm me down, it helped to focus me, and a lot of times I just had to refocus myself. And there's this song I sing, and I would always just go back to that, and it's from scripture. He will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on thee. I will keep you in perfect peace. I will keep you in Perfect peace, oh, whose mind is stayed on thee. Mm -hmm. I will keep you in perfect peace. I was able to prepare myself for them having to go to the NICU because the plan was for them to be born by C-section within 30 to 32 weeks. Um, so I was prepared for that piece of it. What I wasn't prepared for was me having to go home <laughs> and leave them here. You know, I wanted to stay. Isn't that crazy? I was so ready to leave and then they come and I'm like, I'll stay in the room, that's not a problem. We in healthcare have an incredible invitation uh, to enter into people's lives at the time of their greatest vulnerability. And it is really a solemn trust that we're given. Uh, they, they invite us into their lives. Uh, and so our, our attitude needs to, to treat that invitation uh, and the entering into their vulnerability, into this little portion of their lives with great dignity and great respect. 
Um, sometimes uh, they are moments uh, of great joy and happiness, as in the birth of children. And sometimes they're moments of great sadness, as uh, in the end of life. Uh, and all of those moments are very, very sacred. Father, we pause and we thank you for this day that you've given us, almost gone. Father, we thank you for this food and set before us. We pray that you'd bless it to the nourishment of our bodies. Bless this food now. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It affects my love big. And I try to talk to him now about me dying. It's coming. And they, they need to watch for it. And they need to talk to me. Because I'm going to be leaving them very soon. My daughter since they've been here. Been here probably four times. Four times. And she knows I'm dying. She knows I'm dying. That hurts. That hurts me. My son. <clears throat> about the many times that hurts me. We, we all, in some ways, fear death. Uh, we don't know what's on the other side. It's unknown to us all. Um, we have all kinds of uh, concepts that have been built up, some mythical, some not, uh, about what the afterlife might look like. Uh, and there's always the, the fear and the uh, reluctance to leave our loved ones and, and those uh, with whom we are comfortable and have developed uh, great capacities and relationships. It's a very uh, incredible dynamic that we have uh, of being able to provide for uh, those babies who come into the world uh, with some degree of um, uh, difficulty uh, and need special care. Um, and it brings out the most caring and compassionate side uh, of our associates. Baby A is Zara Elizabeth and baby B is Zoe Mariah. As a safe space, you know, as stability, as providers, um, people who taught them that they don't need to stress. You know, you want to work hard, teach them to work hard for things, but if you stress so much about things, you lose out on what's right in front of you. Whatever I have a baby, try to teach it the values of growing up and loving God. Most important thing is loving God. Listen to your parents. They've been through it. They know. And what they tell you, Listen, listen to what they told you. I feel like I'm gonna have to take it a day at a time because I need to tell them apart first, right? Yeah, I would say yes. <laughs> That'll probably be the first thing that I try to focus on. Paw Patrol to the lookout, shouts Ryder. Pup house transforms into a fire truck. Inside this pup pack is a double spray fire hose and uh, chaos. <laughs> Organized chaos. They've doubled their weight and so they just keep growing. They're doing really well developmentally and they're super cute. So that makes it easy. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't be frustrated because they're really cute. I hope that them watching me and their dad will encourage them and help them to make good decisions in the future. You know, if not, we'll be there. <laughs> but also faith, you know, faith is really important. So raising them in the church. Are you gonna go to meet me? But just give them a, a good, healthy life. When we look back, I think the past few months have been a blur. And so, like you said, the new normal, we're trying to get into a really good, solid routine. But I think we've just been running so much. I don't think we realized how long they were in the NICU. And then before that, me being in the hospital. So them being home, it's just, we're happy every day. Like we might be like zombies <laughs> and completely exhausted, but we make it work. I mean, we are so happy they're home. Oh, wait, don't look your hand, hold on. 
The challenges that we have are, are to, to help people see that each moment in their life is filled with grace in some way. Uh, that even in those moments of tragedy and pain and suffering, that there is grace present there, uh, as well as in those moments of great joy and happiness. Uh, and so uh, within these walls then, the work is extraordinarily sacred, um, uh, urging people to, to see the hope and the grace that is present uh, and the reality of, of God's loving kindness wrapped around them in all of these circumstances and situations. People have all kinds of different impressions of, of what the afterlife is or that there even is an afterlife. Uh, and so our goal is not to convince them of anything, uh, but, but just to be present with them uh, and provide that, that companionship uh, and that, uh, that peace. I've been waiting for this. And it's finally coming. I'm finally getting what I'm wanting. I'm going home. I wish I had the light. for everyone Cause we're all chasing ghosts This is certainly emblematic uh, of the work of the daughters both. One of the things that we want to make sure that we don't lose is the, the legacy that we've been given by the daughters of charity. Our religious attitude and, and our faith perspectives help, helps us to understand uh, the sacredness of each moment of life uh, and, and to treat that as well. It doesn't matter whether we're treating a homeless man or the CEO of a corporation uh, or a helpless infant um, or a demented uh, elder. Uh, the fact is that, that all persons are made in the image of God and, and with that perspective we're able to, to uh, affect a greater sense of dignity and a greater sense of respect uh, for all of our patients. When you Run dry like the desert.